For more debates, updates and bonus content, sign up at thebigconversation.show. Interesting, isn't it, that that it's almost as though AI technology is almost taking the place of religion in that sense, in kind of fulfilling the promises that have traditionally been seen as, as those of, of faith, of, of a kind of future life, a life uh, everlasting and so on. Well, I mean, is that... Um, what, what, I suppose what's what's behind that drive, do you think, Nick, for people to want to, to kind of be able to, to sort of live forever in a sort of digital space in that kind of way? Um, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I think there is like some mundane level of motivation, like most of us just put on a seatbelt because we don't want to die or get injured in a car crash. And you know, we avoid the most unhealthy food because or smoking because we think we might get cancer. And like, the, nor, there's that's the kind of commonsensical desire that most people have, if, assuming their lives are sort of reasonably okay to prefer to to live and be healthy. And so, for some people, I think it's just like an extrapolation of that that maybe they see this is like a possible um, additional means by which you could increase the amount of expected future life that you have in this life, in this world. Um, uh, and, and then it's a cost benefit thing. Like, so depending on whatever, how, how, how rich they are, maybe if it's a very small fraction of their income that would have to go to pay the life insurance premium every month, and they would rather give up a, a cappuccino every day and have this that then gives them X percent chance. Um, I'm, I'm sure that for some people, it, that might be a more complicated or idiosyncratic psychological thing where they need some Maybe they are not religious and they still have a psychological need for some straw to cling on to that could give them hope. I, I, I don't want to speculate as to the kind of deep psychological roots for all of these people. Um, I mean, the most striking thing, if anything, is maybe just how few people are. I mean, it's, this chronic thing has been around for many decades now, right? And it's still very much a niche. It's growing, but it's like a very slow linear rate. Um, and you'd think that we just see like t the state of technology is becoming more advanced. A lot of these other ideas that were really out on the fringes uh, 20, 30 years ago are now kind of like great advances in, in AI, nanotech, synthetic biology, VR, like all of these things now seem like, oh yeah, we are making progress. A lot of people think, yeah, maybe e even this stuff about the simulation, right? That's become quite mainstream. Like a lot of people are tweeting and blogging, Elon Musk is tweeting and um, but, but for some reason, Chronix still remains this kind of uh, just as much a niche thing today as it, as it did back in, in the 90s. Uh, that that mm. maybe is more the thing That's that to interesting. Me, yeah. uh, strikes me as needing explanation. Yeah. What, what do you think, Roz, about this idea of a sort of, you know, could, could AI technology be the future to a, a form of immortality? Again, I guess there's a lot of speculation there, um, but and, and a lot of sci-fi dramas do hang on this idea that you could, in principle, upload one's consciousness into some mm -hmm. digital format, uh, which again is something a very well. If it's happening, it's a, it's a long way off, and there's the question of whether it could happen at all anyway. But um, but what's your? I, I'd be interested in your general thoughts on this whole concept. Yeah, I, you know there there could in the future be you know deep fake synthetic versions of each of us having this talk right now and then also taking every other digital form of talks or typing all of our google takeout everything we've searched for or texted or written an email to somebody on uh, that can be recomposited into a synthetic being that uh, plays as a as an agent with somebody you could talk to we've already been doing this in the mit media lab you know you build a little agent that's for the deceased professor and ask what that one would have thought, right? Actually, one is a Marvin Minsky bot, and he's one of the ones who also signed up for cryogenics, and that hasn't um, resurrected him yet, but we can resurrect some of what he said online with a digital form. And it's a kind of immortality, right? I find it interesting, though, that we, uh, so many people I know who aren't, uh, you know, who haven't thought that much about God or what they believe in the afterlife still desire it. It's almost like we're made for it, right? Like that, you know, some, some people say, you know, you're hungry because you know, you're made to eat food, you're thirsty, you're made to, to drink. Um, maybe we are 
uh, there's something in us that is immortal that desires immortality. We, uh, you know, like um, Seneca saying, the Greek philosopher saying, we are we are like mortals in what we fear and like immortals in what we desire. We uh, seem to have something in us that seeks that beyond. Uh, at the same time, I don't think a lot of us have thought about it that deeply, what we do in that beyond. And there is a worry, you know, if you have an infinite number of grandchildren, you know, how are you going to attend all those birthday parties, right? <laughs> you know, there, there are some practical elements that are, uh, you know, that we don't understand. We don't know how we're going to deal with. Uh, but yeah, there's this almost universal desire for it. Yes. Um, I mean, d d does the concept nick of of everyone choosing at some point to to live in you know to just keep living uh, whether it be in physical bodies by that time you know maybe the technology is there that you can implant your consciousness into a robot and we can continue living in the physical world uh or or it's otherwise in some kind of digital space where you know we can create our own reality and, and have a lovely ever after i mean again it's a subjective question but does that is that, is that a good thing as far as you're concerned or or do you worry at the idea of sort of just carrying on and on and on because technology allows us to? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know exactly how long would be the optimal um, lifespan. I think it certainly would seem to depend a lot on the conditions. Like, so first of all, I think our intuitions about the desirability of longer than usual lives are shaped very heavily by the fact that in this world, uh, older age is uh, associated with worse health, right? So you, you, ne you never really get people much above a hundred who are in perfect mental condition and fully productive and run marathons and stuff like it. So we just see this very strong association that at a certain point, we just fall apart. And it, it's kind of sad and you certainly don't want to just extrapolate that and then think we want a hundred more years where you're sort of kept alive on some respirator sure. and like the whole medical team is kind of that, that, that seems utterly pointless. So we have to, first of all, ex exert the, the, the mental push to imagine a different condition where you would actually, maybe you would get stronger every year and healthier and learn more and, and get new capabilities. And that, that already seems to quite radically change the aspect of, of, of this scenario. Um, I mean, it's kind of sad, I think, that we start early in life at our peak and then at a certain point we go down. Like, if anything, one would maybe think you would want to start at the bottom and then go up. But anyway, so, so that would be one variable. And then, of course, the world we live um, in and w what other people might also be there. Like, another thing is you think, if I lived longer, but everybody else, everybody I cared about, my friends and family, they were all dying off to a lot of people. That doesn't seem very appealing because they'd imagine themselves be lonely and so forth. But in a scenario where many together could do this, continue the adventure, then maybe that flips. Maybe you don't, if everybody else has got to go on and continue the adventure, you would feel, I don't want to lose out. Like if everybody else, if the party is still going, you get the FOMO effect, right? So without yeah. like adding a lot of these specifications, it's hard to evaluate it positively or negatively. Um, and then I would say on top of that, though, like if we consider really radically long, even long finite lifespans, like a million years or something like that, let, let alone infinite time, that then I think it becomes even harder uh, because those are just so, so far beyond what, uh, what, what, what we are normally assuming when, when we are thinking about living but, or dying. But it, it does sound to me a little bit, lit, Nick, like you regret the fact that we do live in this sort of physical body which does wear out. You, you, it sounds like if there was a way of stopping that, you would welcome it. You, the, you're, you don't want life to wear out. You don't I mean, want so certainly to if there were like an anti, limited like a pill that postponed and so the on. aging, I'd be happy. Like, I mean, and people try, right, with creams and everything, like snail extracts from korea like every, every possible means right that if, if there were ways of not just preventing it from showing up but of actually preventing the cellular degradation i'm, I'm sure once that technology exists it will be extremely popular even amongst those people who now kind of dismiss it as saying oh that's this kind of hubristic thing we wouldn't want to have anything to do with it's easy to say when no anti-aging medicine actually exists but once it's there like do you want to have worse knees year by year 
and like an aching hip or would you want to have a good hip and good knees and like a good heart and all your neurons still there like i mean it seems like an easy choice it it, 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 it it's a fascinating question because at one level ros that's kind of what you're involved in you're involved in helping people live happier healthier longer lives mm -hmm. with ai with the technology you've developed but where yeah. does this line exist between what's healthy and what's not healthy when it comes to you know encouraging some huge long lifespan which seems so out of keeping with our normal human condition in that sense it's a great question we had a big effort at at MIT Media Lab years ago called Human 2.0. And it had a physical component with Hugh Hare and his biomechatronics, you know, replacing limbs and giving, this one woman walked in and her legs were so amazing. I'm like, wow, look at, I, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a happily married heterosexual woman and I'm, I'm admiring this other woman's legs. Um, and it turned <laughs> out they were artificial uh, and they were gorgeous. Wow. And she said, I don't know why people say I don't have any legs. I have six pair, you know. And she she had legs that could do all these different amazing things. I mean, she clearly and Hugh can climb rocks brilliantly and even better with some of the different legs he's built. So we know we can physically augment in amazing ways that uh, you know could maybe make it so that I don't need to take a car or train from Boston to New York. I could walk and burn off uh, and justify eating more delicious, fattening things uh, without getting fat. So there are all kinds of ways we could augment ourselves. But we, um, we were also looking, in my case, at the cognitive affective augmentation. We have a lot of efforts in our lab on that. Could we augment our memory? Could we augment our emotion regulation? Could we help people on the autism spectrum who have difficulty interpreting emotional signals, especially in real time, you know, maybe they're concentrating hard to understand your words and they can't read the ocean waves, 10,000 other patterns of things changing on your face, the complexity of which in a two-way conversation quickly dwarfs not just the moves in chess, but the moves in go for all the possible combinations. It's, it's just, it grows so fast. It's so hard for a person to comprehend it and for a computer to comprehend it. And we, uh, we, as we learn about it, we realize how incredibly complicated all this stuff is and how little we really understand it uh, and how hard it is to help people today, much less augment ourselves in the future. But we think it's a really worthy goal for AI. And the more people maybe who work on those, call them more AI for good causes, you know, to help augment and expand human abilities maybe the fewer people will work on the ai for bad causes that just make the rich richer and the and exert more control over people and don't treat them with justice